we're in chapter 11 here in the Gospel of Luke. And so what we'll do is we'll begin reading together here in Luke chapter 11 at verse 27. I'll read verses 27 and 28 and then move on in to verse 29 and we'll conclude uh, with verse 36 tonight. So let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 11 at verse 27. We'll read verses 27 and 28 and uh, get into our study. Luke writes, It happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, as Jesus is speaking here, and we've been recently going through the things that he has to say and all, and as he's speaking with such power and such authority, there's a woman in the crowd who's listening to him speak, and she, in a moment of exuberant praise, raises up her voice and cries out a blessing. And, and it would seem obvious that this woman is thinking of how great Jesus Christ is and, and, and what an honor it would be uh, to be his mother. Now, on one level, her recognition of how blessed Mary was is obviously understandable. I mean, when you look in in the Gospel of Luke in, in chapter 1, and you remind yourself how that when Mary went to go see her cousin Elizabeth, and you remember the greeting that her cousin Elizabeth gave her, it can give you some insight into how you can understand why this woman would say, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. Because in Luke chapter 1, verse 42, uh, the Bible tells us that Elizabeth spoke out with a loud voice, and this is what her cousin Elizabeth said to her, said to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And so what this woman is saying here in this crowd when she says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you, is something that had earlier been stated by Mary's own cousin to a similar degree all the way back uh, in the first chapter of Luke. And, and remember with me in chapter 1, verse 48, Mary's response because Mary at that point said, uh, God, my Savior, has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And so this woman on one level in crying out, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you, is basically simply going along with what had been done before and something that Mary had, had said herself. Uh, Mary had recognized that she had been given the greatest blessing imaginable. So, it's understandable. It's understandable that the woman in the crowd would say this. Yet, I want you to see something. I want you to see verse 28. I want you to see that Jesus corrects this woman. And, and why would Jesus correct her? Because notice he says in verse 28, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, why would he bring a word of correction? Because that's what it is. Jesus brings a word of correction because though what she says is true, there's a wrong emphasis. He corrects her because she has placed the emphasis on the wrong person. What she is doing is emphasizing Mary's blessedness, but she is de-emphasizing Jesus' ministry. And a second thing is that she is failing to consider the fact that Jesus came to bless not just his mother, but Jesus Christ came to bless all people. And there's a theological thing I want to point out to you that is very important that I think wraps this, this up. Because on top of this, and you might want to note this, on top of this, Jesus was not about to receive praise through his mother. He was not about to receive praise through his mother. In doing so, if he were to receive praise through his mother, that would depreciate him, and it would direct praise to the wrong person. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my praise I will give to no one else, neither my glory to graven images. I do not allow anybody to receive praise that is rightfully mine. And so, if he were to receive praise through the mother then that would be taking praise from him. And so that would emphasize her blessedness, but it would de-emphasize his ministry. So he's not going to allow any confusion to come when it comes to praise and honor because he's the one who receives all of it. 
He's the one who's to receive it all. Now, as I say that, sometimes people will say, well, this is the problem I have with, with you or with Protestants because you don't give honor to Mary. You don't give her the kind of honor that she deserves. I find it interesting, and I want you to see this with me. I find it interesting uh, how that Jesus related to his mom. Turn with me for a moment to John's Gospel, chapter 2. I want to develop this with you. See, the question is, well, do you honor Mary? And the answer is yes. We regard her. We especially regard her counsel. We regard her counsel. In John's Gospel, chapter 2, the first gospel to your right, chapter 2, Beginning at verse 1, notice something with me. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says there, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me my hour has not yet come. And I want you to see that for a moment. And so in the midst of all the celebration of a wedding and, and Jesus' presence there demonstrating his, his blessing on that particular institution as well as personally on that wedding, as Jesus is there in Cana of Galilee, his mother approaches him and says, there's a need here. And I want you to see how Jesus responds. He simply says, what has your concern got to do with me? Now, when he says woman, that isn't a disrespectful thing. I mean, sometimes you might read that and you might say, it sounds to me as if the Lord Jesus Christ is disrespecting his mother. Woman is actually a term of honor. It's not something that is used lightly at all. And Jesus himself was using it in an honorable and respectful way as he spoke to mom. But he said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? I want you to see something because I have had people say, don't you honor Mary? And I say especially, yes, I do. Of course I do. She is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. She was blessed amongst all women. Obviously, Scripture points to her as being a woman who has been blessed tremendously to be the mother of Jesus Christ. And of course, I do honor the reality of that. But I like to take her advice. And so, the advice that she gives is something that we, the church, ought to listen to because notice what it says in verse 5 when it says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, that's the whole key, isn't it? She doesn't say, whatever I say to you, do it. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, what is it that Jesus says that we ought to honor? And now, you can get a whole theology of salvation through that. What is it that Jesus said? A man must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Over and over again, you can take the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and follow the advice of Mary, his mother, and you're going to be walking straight with the Lord because she didn't take honor from him and she didn't draw it to herself. She pointed it to him and she said, whatever he says to you, that is what you are to do. And so as a Christian, as an individual who wants to be biblical, of course, I see her as blessed and all. But turning back to Luke chapter 11, I take Jesus' words of greater, with greater emphasis. And his word is more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, my family is much larger than you think. Loving obedience to my word will bring you into my family. You need to have a relationship with me. It's not something that is just... just uh, uh, I, I, you're not going to become a member of my family by being related to me. You can become a member of my family by obeying the Word of God. In, in Mark, in chapter 3, verses 32 through 35, uh, Mark writes, a multitude was sitting around him, and, and they said to him, Behold, your, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. He becomes, she becomes a member of my family. And so when he says more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, you're hearing him as he commands and as he calls us to have a relationship with him. We're following his mother's advice when she says, whatever he says to you, do it. And we receive him as our Lord and our Savior. And we become people who not only hear God's word, but we, as he says, we keep it also. So the one who is going to be blessed is not simply the person who's listening, it's the person who listens and acts on the things that God has to say. In James, in chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, James said it this way. He said, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. 
But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so we get up in the morning. We start getting ourselves ready to go to work or wherever it is that we're going. We spend a considerable amount of time looking into that mirror, looking at ourselves. And then we go about the house doing a few things before we leave. And then inevitably, we walk back to that same mirror and look at it one more time. We just can't get enough of us as we do so. And we look one more time at that mirror. And then we climb in our car. And then sometimes as we're driving wherever it is, and we've already spent a good amount of time smiling at us. We've already done that more than once in the house. Now we're in the car. And as we're in the car, we pull that rearview mirror down and just smile that winning smile one more time, and that's what we do. Then when we get to where we're going, and if we happen to walk by a reflective glass or a mirror, what is it that we do again? Hey, we do that. We look at ourselves one more time. We forget what manner of person we are. And so what Jesus would be teaching us and what James is simply saying is this, don't be a forgetful hearer. Be a doer. Be somebody who keeps a, a constant awareness of who you are and all. You look in the mirror and you walk away forgetting what you are. But listen, what you do is if you keep the Word of God, you're actually being transitioned. You're being transformed. You're being changed by that. And as a result of that, then, then you're growing more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So if I look into a mirror at myself, the Word can also be a mirror. So I look at the mirror of the Word so that it reveals to me my imperfections and flaws, and I can actually change. And some of us uh, know what it's like to have one of those mirrors with, a, with the various settings, you know, the lights and everything that you can get. You can have a mirror that has night light and you can have full daylight and everything in between. And, and, and I've discovered that I'm beautiful at 3 o'clock in the morning in the dark. <laughs> but in the full light of day, there's a little bit of a difference. You know, when you have the full light of day, you can see those imperfections and and all of that, and that's just the way it is, you know. And, and some lights are of such nature that they can reveal imperfections that you've tried to hide. I can still remember when, uh, when I was a young hippie, uh, back in the 60s and all, we had what were called black lights. And some of you, you know, that, that comes and goes, it still comes and goes, you know. And, and we used to take murine, and we would spray it all over ourselves, make artwork on us. Murine, it dries. And you get underneath the black light, and you've got all your artwork, and people would go, oh, wow, cool, cool, you know. And, and, and so we would put peace signs on us and, you know, spray us up. Now, you could not see that under normal lighting, but you go under a black light, and it all shows up, and so we'd freak each other out that way. But I also discovered something. There's something called clearasil. Some of you know what that is. Under a black light, clearasil shows up. And I had a friend of mine named Mike, and, and, uh, and you could connect the dots with him. Now, you, you, didn't, you didn't see the clearasil under normal lighting, but one day there he was under the black light, and I looked at him, and it looked like he had chicken pox. And what he had done is he had been putting clearasil all over his ugly little face. You know. <laughs> the light has a tendency of revealing imperfections. If we want to walk in a way that reflects Christ, then we're to be doers of the Word not forgetful hearers. And so Jesus is emphasizing that here in Luke chapter 11 at verse 28. Yes, it is true, my mother is blessed from the very beginning as the Lord God gave to her this communication that she would be the mother of Messiah. She is blessed. And yes, all people from henceforth will call her blessed. But do not emphasize my mother to the point where other people are negated. Yes, mama is blessed. Of course, she heard and obeyed. But if you hear and obey, you are blessed too. And you are part of my family through faith. Now, verse 29, while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. And so, 
As Jesus is now speaking concerning eternal things, inevitably some desire to argue. Now, Matthew tells us in his gospel in chapter 12, verse 38, that uh, the ones who bring up this argument are, are scribes and Pharisees, and they are actually asking Jesus for a sign. It, it could be that these scribes and these Pharisees made up a special investigating committee. But the demand that they're making here in this passage reveals their hardened hearts. They're not interested in the truth. They're not trying to engage Jesus in a discussion to help them to come to a knowledge of God. They simply want to quarrel. Now, during this time, the scribes were the legal experts. They were experts on the religious law of Moses. In order to be a scribe, you needed to be some 30 years of age, and you needed to have spent many years intensely studying the Scriptures, especially the law of Moses. And the scribes had memorized the traditions that had been set forth by the elders over the centuries. That's why when you read on the scribes in the Gospels, you'll see that they will quote the authorities. They don't offer their own understanding, but will quote somebody else. So when Jesus began his ministry, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, it would amaze them because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes would quote a former rabbi. So it's the scribes who are saying to him, show us a sign. Obviously, unbelievers demand signs, and Christians don't. But what they're doing here is they're demanding proof of his claim to being their Messiah. Now, this is very common amongst the Jews during that day because Paul makes reference in 1 Corinthians 1.22 when he says Jews demand miraculous signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. Now, in asking for a sign, I find it interesting because signs are part of the validation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. You might find this interesting, but in the fifth chapter of, of the Gospel of John, uh, John actually cites four testimonies of Jesus' ministry credentials. Jesus tells them in John chapter 5 the things that point to him. So, for example, in John chapter 5, verse 33, he says, you have sent to John, he has testified to the truth. So, John the Baptist was one who, who validated my ministry. In John 5, 37, he says, the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. In John 5, 39, he says, you diligently study the Scriptures. You think that in them you possess eternal life, and the Scriptures testify about me. So you have the testimony of John, the testimony of the Father, the testimony of Scripture, but he also includes in John 5, 36, miraculous signs, because he says, I have testimony weightier than that of John. The work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies that the Father has sent me. And so signs were part of the way God validates the ministry of Jesus Christ. So his father validates, the scripture validates, John the Baptist validates, and signs will validate. Now the problem is, is they're making a request for a sign, but with insincerity. They are not seeking him, but are looking to dishonor him, and that's why Jesus speaks in the way that he does. Notice how he speaks concerning their, them in verse 29 when he speaks of them as being an evil generation. The reason he says you're an evil generation is because you have no sincerity, what you're trying to do is tempt me. That word evil uh, just re reflects the fact that they are constantly tempting God. And, and Matthew 4, 7 says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So he calls them evil. He calls them evil because if they were faithfully following the word of God, they would have accepted him because his, the word of God pointed directly to him. In John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47, if you believed Moses... You would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? And so, if they would have been honestly following Moses, these scribes who were the experts of the law, they would have seen Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament and become his followers. But seeing that they refused to hear what Moses had to say, they were refusing to receive their own Messiah. It's God's Word always that draws you to a relationship with Him. 
And when the Word of God is rightly divided and proclaimed, God uses His Word to bring people through the power of the Holy Spirit to a place of conviction so they can have a relationship with Him. But Jesus is saying, you don't want to have anything to do with me. So he goes on in verse 30 and he says, uh, as Jonah became assigned in the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Now, Jonah, he uses Jonah. What is it that's going to be the sign that he's referring to? Well, what it will be will be his resurrection. Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites because he's an individual who had been swallowed by a great fish, should have been dead, was spit up on the shore, and ultimately came and preached a message of repentance and was a sign. He had the appearance of being dead and coming back to life. Now, remember Jonah. Jonah was commissioned to preach in the great Assyrian city of Nineveh. The Bible in Jonah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says that God said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You know the story of Jonah. And during his, his escape, he thought he was escaping from God, a, a storm arose. And, and Jonah, uh, after the people began to question, why is this storm happening? Well, Jonah reveals, well, I'm a prophet of the Most High God, and, he, and uh, it's my fault in, in order to quell the storm. You might as well just throw me overboard. In a way, he's once again saying, look, if I'm thrown overboard, then I die, and I don't have to go to, to Nineveh, and I'll be free from that. But what is it that the Lord does? Well, all the time that Jonah had been running, climbing into that boat, going down to the bottom, and just kind of like floating, you almost hear, you know, him as he's going, the sound of the of the ship as it's there on, on, the, on the sea and all and the wind blowing them. Well, there's, you know, someplace else there's a giant fish that's very, very slowly but surely just, you know, making his way very slowly, intersecting with the ship, just very slowly, you know, boom, 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 boom you know, that kind of thing. They throw him over, and there's the fish. Perfect timing in the way of the Lord. The Bible tells us in Jonah 1.17, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now think about that for just a moment. If you have claustrophobia, that would have been phobia, that would have been a killer. But he had plenty of time to think. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And in Jonah 2, 7 and 10, 7 through 10, this is what he says. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. What an interesting way to put it. The fish opens his mouth, and as he came out, you know, he's got seaweed wrapped around him. The digestive juices undoubtedly have made him look like a little prune. He probably smells pretty bad. I'd assume that he did because he's been laying in there with all of these fish that have been being digested. It must have been a wonderful sight to see. And as he climbs out of that, that fish, he, he walks to, to Nineveh, walks in, and when they see this guy coming, whoo, you know, yet 40 days and the Lord's going to destroy you. What do we have to do? You know, we'll get saved right now. A tremendous ministry, but I wouldn't necessarily want it. The resurrection, though, is what Jesus is referring to. And his resurrection is going to be the greatest sign of who he is, even as Jonah was in the body of that, in, in, the, in the belly of that great fish for three days, even so Jesus himself would be in the belly of the earth for three days. It's a picture of his resurrection, and so that's the point he's making. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, Paul would say, Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so that's what he's speaking about. As Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. 
And so now he speaks concerning the queen of the south, rising up with the judgment, rising up in the judgment with the men of this, of this generation. The queen of the south is a reference to the queen of Sheba. And she had traveled many miles to hear the wisdom of one named Solomon. In 1 Kings, in chapter 10, verses 6 through 9, the Bible tells us that she said to Solomon, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. And then she went on to say, Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Now, he says she's going to rise up in the judgment as a witness to the greatness of God and Solomon's wisdom. The point Jesus is making, though, is my message is greater. I not only am exercising wisdom, but salvation from sin is the result of my message. And so Jesus came proclaiming a message that could save people if people would only hear what he had to say. If people would embrace his message, they could be saved. Now, we're in the Christmas season now, and, and the debate's already beginning, and some of you watch news and all, and I do on a daily basis. I'll watch the news, and I look for the culture wars to see what's going on and, and uh, whether or not the words Merry Christmas will be banned once again this year or whether people actually will remember the holiday and what it stands for. And so I'm watching um, the news yesterday, and, and there's a woman who's saying, don't make a big deal out of this, and she's presenting herself as as a representative of Christian faith and all, and she's saying, you ought not to be making a big de uh, deal about this. You know, the real message is that we need to really just learn to get along. Is that the message of the gospel? <laughs> is that the message? You know, you know, as much as lies within you, live at peace with all men. Yes, that is something that Paul teaches us to do. The Scripture teaches us that we're not to be belligerent, we're not to be hostile, and all of that. Yes, we ought to do everything within us to be able to get along with, with people. Undoubtedly, is that the message of Christmas? No, I mean, from the beginning unto you this day is born a Savior, is what the Scripture says. I mean, when you're, when you're looking at Jesus Christ, you're not looking at the birth of an ordinary child. What you're looking at is a miracle birth with a purpose, and that purpose is that Jesus Christ might come and save people from their sins. That's what He is. He's the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God who's been sent by God in order that He might bring a message to draw people to Himself in order that they might be saved. That's why He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto Myself. He was pointing to the cross because He was making it very clear that when I am crucified, people will be drawn by the message of the cross and why I died. And that's Christianity. And so anything that denies the reality of who Jesus Christ is as Savior of the world, anybody who says that Christmas is something that can be celebrated without Christ in it and his whole purpose is, is sadly mistaken. And yet we hear that constantly. Jesus Christ spoke a message that is very powerful and very divisive. It's a very divisive message. I mean, if you embrace it fully, then you really believe that without him, you can't go to heaven. If you really believe his message, you're going to believe that you have to tell people about Christ so that they might be saved. If you really believe his message, then you're going to be somebody who comes from Spain, goes to school, and goes back to tell these people that they need Jesus Christ. That's how that works. That's what causes us to do the work that we do. We actually believe that message. Yes, Solomon has incredible, incredible wisdom. He gave hundreds into the thousands of Proverbs. He wrote many songs, and you can see that in Scripture. He wrote books, three different books that are attributed to him. This is a man with incredible wisdom. Yes, he was so rich and so prosperous that gold was like dust during his day. Yes, he had a throne that was made with pure ivory, and it was overlaid with gold, and it was incredible. He ate on golden plates and drank from golden goblets, and yeah, he had incredible wisdom, and people from all all around would come to hear the wisdom of Solomon. It was proverbial to this day. And the queen of Sheba who came said, I haven't heard the half of it. You are incredible, all that you have. And God has blessed the nation of Israel by giving this nation such a mighty and wise king. Absolutely. But Jesus is saying, Solomon is nothing compared to who I am. That's what he's saying. Think about that for a minute. Solomon is nothing compared to who I am. He brought you wisdom, yes, in his message, but when you see the salvation inferences there, that's because he's pointing you to the one who brings salvation. He's pointing you to me. That's what he's saying when he says in verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. 
For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So the men of Nineveh who repented at the message of destruction will ultimately through their salvation be the judges of these people. In Jonah 3, 5, and 6, it says, The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. They accepted the message of repentance. They, in their salvation, through that belief, will be a judge to you as you reject it. He goes on in verse 33 and says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. God's people are to reveal God's light to those who are living in darkness. We are the light of Christ, and we give off the light when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, not all people like us for that, but that's what happens. Some people like the darkness, and they don't like their evil deeds being revealed. We know that. Those of us who used to party and all, we know that. There were many times when I was a kid, and I'd be in a room, and the lights were all off, and and we'd be in that room and all, and, and doing things we ought not to be doing. And if somebody walks in and turns the light on, what's the first thing that we would say? Well, people like me would say, turn the light off. Why? Because with the light, you can see what I'm doing. I prefer the darkness because I can hide my deeds in the dark. But when when the light's on, then I'm going to be restricted from doing the evil I want to do. And that's just a fact, guys. And, And when you and I, when we begin to actually take the Word of God seriously, like Jesus said, uh, not only hearing the Word of God and keeping it, when we actually are serious about being Christians, when we actually care and, and, and we live in such a way that our lives are different and they see that we're serious, well, yeah, some people will say, thank you for bringing the truth to me and others will say I don't like hearing a word you're saying and Jesus in John 8 12 said I'm the light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life so this light is intended to bring light in dark places and what do you do with it well you put it on a lampstand so that the house may be illuminated that's what the body of Christ is to do well in verse 34 he says the lamp of the body is the eye therefore when your eye is good your whole body is also is full of light but When your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If if then your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, well, the whole body would be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. So when he speaks of the lamp of the body being the eye, this speaks of singleness of vision. Singleness of vision produces singleness of priorities. That's what he's saying here. If your eye is good meaning single or devoted, you're going to have God's light leading you. But if your eye is evil or bad, that means unhealthy or or unfocused, you will walk in spiritual blindness. And so what we need is spiritual illumination. We need the light of the Spirit within us, the light of the Word of God, which lightens our pathway, in order that we might live lives that are, are pleasing to God. So what is my priority? That's what he's speaking about. When he speaks concerning your, your eye, whether it's good or bad, what is my priority? What are the things that I focus on? Do I focus on the right things? Well, that's the challenge, isn't it? The challenge is to keep my eyes on the prize, keep my eyes on Jesus Christ, keep my eyes on the right kind of things. Like Job said, making a covenant with my eyes so that I might not look on like he says, so that I might not look at a, a maiden. In other words, keeping my eyes on the right things so that I'm not corrupted with wrong desires. Keep your eyes on the prize, guys. Uh, you know, I, I realize that the world we're living in is, is more and more difficult. I, I, I realize that. I, I know that. But I also have discovered something. I've discovered that the darker it gets, the brighter the light is. You know, my watch here, my watch has a... Um, a feature on it, if I push a little button here, it has one of those illuminated um, dials, you know, and a little light will go on. And uh, I have actually used this light when I've been in, in very dark places as a flashlight. I can use it as a flashlight. 
because the light, it doesn't take an awful lot of light to dispel darkness. It just takes a little bit, especially if it's really dark. So I have used this in very dark places before just to help me to get from place to place. I have a phone. My phone, you, you turn the phone on and it has a light that goes on immediately. It illuminates so I can, you know, make my call and all. I use that at my house because when I'm climbing up the stairways, I'll be honest with you, I can, I, I have, I'm night blind and so I can actually trip and it's not hard for me to do so. I actually use my phone so that it's like a little flashlight. And at night, if I have to get up, I have my phone next to me. I actually can use that as a flashlight. And I walk through the house with that until I get to one of the switches and all of that. Just this morning, I wanted to wake Marie up, and it was dark, so I turned my phone on, and I put the light right in her face. You know, I said, awaken to the light, thou that sleepest, you know, so. And the light of Christ will shine upon thee. She didn't appreciate that, but I thought it was spiritual. We just need to have spiritual light. We were walking in the darkness long enough. And when you accept Christ, then he enlightens your darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, John says, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And so... When you have spiritual priorities, you walk in the light of life. The Word of God is a lamp and a light to your path and your feet. You get into, the, into God's Word, you walk in His Spirit, you obey Him, God illuminates you, people will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, or they may get upset because you are bringing a conviction to their life because you reveal what they're all about. But the fact is, God is moving through all of this. Some people will receive Christ because of that light that is shining in you that is going to be explained through the, through the declaration of the gospel. So then people say, what is it that makes you the way you are? You can say, well, you know what? Uh, anything, if you see anything good in me at all, it's the work of the Spirit. God has done something in my life. He's forgiven me of my sins. And, and I appreciate that you can even see a little evidence of that, but that's what it's all about. Well, you mean, I, I thought Christians were, were weird and different and all, and, and you're not a weird person. Well, you know, I am weird. You just don't know me very well. But there are certain things about me that maybe God has fine-tuned, and you can see that is, is His presence, and that's how you do it. You just share. Yeah, this is what the Lord is all about. He's changed my life. He's given me a new direction, and, and I'm just trying to follow after Him. And, and I read His Bible, and His Bible teaches me His ways, and I want to live in a way that pleases Him. It's just that simple. That's how I do it. I've had so many opportunities in simple conversations just to share those very basic things. It's the Lord. He does work. So, all I want to do is make sure that I walk in the light. And so, that's what Jesus is speaking about. Those without the Lord walk in darkness. The gospel is veiled and they're blind. But when you receive Christ, that veil is removed. You see him clearly. You begin to live for him and your life reflects the reality of that. And that's what Jesus is saying. Are you walking in darkness or are you walking in light? If you're walking in light, then you indeed belong to him.